it's done inside each lung. Um, as far as work goes, I mean, so the largest of these objects is internal, but if I had to guess, there's probably 70% of the work is, is interactions with neighboring. And as the number of cores or processors or the size of the machine gets bigger, the ratio of the work with peers versus the ratio of work you're doing internally it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, so your local work vanishes effectively. Right? So as, right, so the number of these... So the interconnect is a big factor in... Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. The, well, the number of these patches is sort of fixed by the size of the simulation. Right. But if you only have one, you know, if, if you have a small number of processors, you may have a large number of these living on the same physical machine. So a lot of this communication doesn't happen. And also, these patches are represented on other processors by proxies. So we're not communicating directly with these compute objects. You have a representation of the patch on the local processor. So each coordinate and force data only gets sent once between physical processors. So this is sort of the first half of how NAMD works. The second half is that NAMD is message driven. So if you've heard, you've heard of MPI, which is the message passing interface. So message passing, we have coordination on both the sending and the receiving side. So in order to transmit a message on processor A, you call send this data to processor B with this tag. Processor B says receive data with this tag. Optionally, receive data with this tag from processor A. And we have this coordinated, you enter into this library and you exit when you've received or transmitted the data. Uh, we use a method that's implemented in the uh, Charm++ system that is one side of communication. So you send a message not to a function call, that's a function that's being called on the other side, you send a message to an object with a method on that object on the other processor. So I put together a message, I say, okay, this message goes to patch 43 on node 5, go. Patch 43, node 5, receive coordinates. I send that message, the message gets transmitted by the runtime, on the other side it goes into a queue, when it gets to the bottom of the queue, it pops out and receive coordinates on patch 43 is called with the data from that message. So we're sending this message to an entry point, and there's this queue that processes incoming messages. So it's an asynchronous? Yes. Thing. Yes. So it's, it's asynchronous, and for performance reasons, you can assign priorities to which messages are more important. So messages that relate to time step five are higher priority than time step six are higher priority than time step seven. So you want to have things that are earlier. Also, uh, work also goes into this queue. So if you have forces that need to be sent back off node, those are higher priority than calculating forces that are only consumed by local patches. So you go into this queue, you may receive coordinates. When you receive coordinates, you say, okay, now I've got these coordinates, I can run this these computations because I've received all the data that they require, those go into the queue with a certain priority. When they execute, okay, now we've got forces. When all the forces for this set of atoms are done, then that transmits data back to the patch for integration for those atoms. So this is sort of how NAMD runs internally. And we've been doing this for you know, well over a decade. And one of the advantages of that is if you have a noisy system, which is pretty much everything except the blue gene these days. Um, Can you explain to them what that means? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So these are different processors. This is 0, 149. A sampling of processors in you know, probably a 2,000 processor run. And red is integration, so moving the position from the previous time step to the next time step based on the forces that are calculated by these blue, the blue objects. So blue is force calculation, red is the integration barrier between time steps. And so as you can see, it's not synchronized, but as we're going along, there's sort of this loose 
causality because you need positions from your neighbors to calculate forces which flow back to you. And as we're going through, something bad happens. This is either the operating system taking over, sucking time away from the actual calculation, which delays these two processors. Rather than causing a giant gap for all the other processors waiting for these results to happen, we adapt around that and you don't end up with sorry, you don't end up with gaps showing up on the other processor until much later on. So we can tolerate a large number of these of short interruptions on individual processors while gradually degrading performance rather than it's like if someone else was waiting for a message from this, it would stop. Instead, that message is delayed. You have something else to do. So the other thing that this lets us do is we overlap different classes of communication. So integration happens. We're computing bonds, angles, A equals and propers. We're computing the pairwise forces, electrostatics and van der Waals. And we're also using particle mesh A wall for long range electrostatics, which is a communication intensive operation. So we take charges, we map them onto a grid, then we do an FFT, you transmit planes of the FFT to other processors, do another FFT, more math, send it back. So this normally severely impacts the scalability of a program, but by overlapping this, we can hide the latency of PME behind the pairwise compute calculations. So when we were looking to move to the GPU, we said, okay, well, most of the work is in the pairwise computes. Let's offload this to the GPU, and then we can use the remaining processors, which are still, you know, pretty significant, to do the more complicated work that doesn't map to the GPU as well. Okay, so we're using message-driven execution inside NAMD. It would be nice to do something directly analogous on the GPU. So what we'd like to do is to take each one of those little compute object diamonds, ship those separately to the GPU, and get results back when they're processed. The problem is that each of those is a single, those diamonds is represented by a single block. So it's not that much work. CUDA needs coarse-grained, you know, 10,000 thread level parallelism, which we just can't provide between two patches with 500 atoms each. Um, also, coded doesn't have any priorities. Um, you can't have a queue of low priority work and insert high priority work at the head of that queue. So, have you? I, I presume you have tested by uh, varying the uh, block size on the cores versus increasing the <coughs> block size on the GPUs to the extent that you can increase work on the GPUs and reduce work on the CPUs to see if both the overall runtime is affected or, or not. Um, you mean with respect to? With respect to uh, the, so you're increasing the work on the GPUs by <coughs> increasing the uh, spatial decomposition in such a way that the, the cores are not doing as much work. No, we're, actu we're actually not modifying the spatial decomposition okay. at all. We're simply moving the non-bonded components to the GPU. GPU. Okay. To the GPU. What? So CUDA doesn't have priorities. So if you have work coming in on a dynamic basis and you want to have a priority queue that you can insert properly into, you have to manage that yourself on the CPU. So perhaps in a future interface, we might be able to do some of this. For me, uh, there are some features that might be useful to this, but so far I haven't seen a direct mapping. There are some priorities in Fermi, but it's not at the level that we're looking for. Okay, so what we can do, though, is we can overlap calculations. So I said some of the forces, you calculate those, those have to be transmitted to another node. Some of the forces are consumed locally, and we give higher priority to the remote, remote forces. So if we have sort of in the process of one time step, we start out with everyone having the positions that they need. The CPU prioritizes calculations where the forces have to be sent to other processors before local. On the GPU, we can do the same thing. So we take all of the little compute objects that are available and we split those up into two 
kernel invocations. The first kernel invocation is for remote forces. The second one is for local forces. So we send all the positions over at once. Because like I said, we can't wait for off-processor positions to show up and then interrupt a running kernel. So we wait for all the positions. We start the remote force. As soon as those forces are available, we return those and start the force communication. Then we can do the local force calculation, and we only have to do uh, updates on the CPU for those positions before exchanging positions. So what this lets us do is it lets us overlap communication between the GPU and the CPU with execution on the CPU and GPU execution with communication between different nodes. And this is what, now oh, I've got to hit this slide. Okay. I think I just explained most of that. There we go. Okay, so and when I say remote forces, so we can imagine we've got these patches are on a local processor, the green patches are on a remote processor. We said we weren't using Newton's second law, so each block in a kernel calculates forces on one patch due to another patch. So these arrows each represent a block in the GPU calculation. When I say remote forces, the green arrows are what would be calculated because they're pointing at a remote patch, whereas the local forces are calculated because they're pointing at a local patch. If we were using Newton's second law, the only local interactions would be these four, between the two local patches or the local patches with themselves. By using one-sided calculation, we get a larger amount of local work that can be delayed until after we transmit forces to the remote patches. And this actually works in practice. So we have to sort of infer what the remote force is doing. Again, integration. The blues are different types of, I should say, the, uh, the teal is positions being transmitted between the processors. Blue is local force calculations. And the fuchsia color is activity interacting with the GPU. So we actually see, okay, positions go up, we calculate the remote forces, we can exchange these, and then once the local forces come back, all this communication overhead has happened on the CPU already, forces come back, and we immediately begin integrating for the next time step as we go across. So this was working really well on the first uh, GPU cluster that we put together, and that had um, you know, a small number, it was like four... GPUs per node and four cores per node, so one-to-one -one mapping. And then NCSA came up with this Lincoln cluster. And Lincoln has two quad-core CPUs per node, and each node is half of a Tesla S1080, which is a quad-core 1U MOX. So we have a four-to-one ratio of CPU cores and GPUs. So the question is, how do you deal with that? The code is written assuming sort of a one-to-one -one mapping between cores and CPUs. So when we try it, it actually you know, works pretty well. We get, uh, we refer to this too, each uh, GPU is roughly equivalent to 12 CPU cores. So adding the GPUs to the node is quadrupling the NAMD performance that we're getting from